Hi, welcome to the channel. Today we're gonna do another airplane review, this time on the Thurston Teal that's sitting behind me. So this is a pretty unique airplane and certainly very interesting to fly, so I hope you'll really enjoy this. Let's go have a quick look around the airplane before we get flying. There were 38 of these aircraft built. Uh, this is number 37, so it's definitely uh, on the rare side of thing. It's an amphibian. Um, 0320, 150 horse, constant speed, manually retracted conventional undercarriage, a large Johnson bar lever for the main gear, a separate one to raise the tail wheel with a uh, mechanical lock. Sponsons on the outsides of the wing, which are removable uh, for winter flying and for an increase in three miles an hour of cruise speed. Definitely want to make sure that we've got all of our plugs in place for our water landing. We've got one here, two at the front of the hull, one at the step, one at the rear, one on the other one. So top mounted tractor style engine, uh, just with the propeller just behind the main cabin, with 43 gallons of fuel in two wing tanks. There was an option for center uh, wing tank as well, but um, we just have the uh, two wing tanks, but 43 gallons is pretty good range and pretty good weight for the aircraft. 2400 RPM, 24 inches of manifold pressure gives us about 100 to 105 miles an hour indicated. Uh, T-tail, water rudder, so you deploy the entire tail wheel uh, with the water rudder in the water for steering. The main gear can be deployed in the water and uh, used to uh, prevent you from rocking around quite so much and for fenders and to also beach the aircraft or to come up on a ramp uh, and things like that. So it's a pretty rugged design, little directionally challenged, very heavy ailerons. We've got long flaps, 10 and 15 degrees of flaps, short ailerons, but very deep on each wing. And uh, this has got the heaviest ailerons of anything I've flown. It's a real big challenge to keep it in a straight line on the runway as well. So this is definitely an aircraft for a pretty high skill set. Now, obviously the engine above does some interesting things for overshoots and things like that, as the uh, thrust vector is a above the main uh, aircraft, so it tends to nose you down. Also, none of your prop wash is going over the wings, so you don't get that initial uh, prop wash coming over your wings, providing you with a little extra lift. The only way to get more lift is to increase that airspeed or increase that angle of attack. So you do have to be a little careful there. Uh, this one didn't have it, but the option was for a uh, combustion heater that lived in the nose. Uh, obviously, uh, exhaust type heater is very difficult to make work from all the way up there. So you could have a combustion heater in the nose of the aircraft. This one actually has an STC for an electric heater. It's pretty small, um, but draws a, a lot of amps and it actually works very nicely. So another really interesting difference with uh, this aircraft is the amount of weight that is on the uh, tail. Uh, the engine is obviously mounted behind the main gear, and um, the tail weight is very high. It's sort of over 400 pounds. So if you actually bring the stick all the way aft with that big uh, T-tail and all the prop wash going right over it, you can actually make it so that you cannot steer the airplane. Uh, it doesn't matter how much brake you use, you'll come to a stop, but it won't turn. So this airplane got some really interesting history and the guy that did a lot of the developing and whose name, uh, Mr. Thurston, is uh, on the aircraft, um, there's a lot that could be learned about him and I think a, a, it, that would be a really interesting uh, documentary in its own right, but uh, just had a little bit of information for you. He was working with Grumman in the Second World War and worked on a project uh, called the Grumman Tadpole, which they only built one of. Really neat looking little airplane. You can probably find a picture of it on uh, on Google. Um, anyway, you'll certainly see some resemblance, especially with regard to the wing sponsons. They look like they came right off of those. So uh, he was involved in, in that aircraft and that project there, and then went on to be involved in uh, the Skipper and the Lake uh, Amphib, and then the Thurston Teal, and many variants there. And uh, they built some, they tried to get Schweizer to build some, and uh, it's just a really interesting story, uh, but they never sort of really got mass production going for this airplane. In fact, the type certificate 
is uh, issued by the FAA uh, requires an FAA inspection for each aircraft they were going to release. So they didn't get like a blanket, okay, yeah, you're good to go, just go build as many as you want. The FAA inspected every single one. So, uh, yeah, re really interesting. Lots more could be looked into that, but uh, maybe we'll save that for another time. So we're coming down the lake here now. I'm going to go ahead and get us uh, ready for water landings, uh, especially since that's going to be a big safety feature right now as we're over water. All right, so first step, I've got to unlock the gear, and as soon as I do that, I lose my lock light there. Now, it's quite a pull to pull this gear up. Now, just a little bit of negative G will really help me pull this up. There we go, and that's up and over center nicely. To finish the gear retraction, I need to bring the tailwheel up. So, press the ball in there, pull that up, and now I get the water landing uh, light on. So, we are now... Wheels up, indicating up, we are set for water landing. I have a mirror out on my sponsor on this side and I can see that the um, main gear's up. Now, the paint is so nice and shiny, I can actually see the tail in the paint and I can see that the tail wheel is also up as well. So we are now rigged for water landing. The gear in the up position actually slows the airplane down, uh, which is complete opposite of most aircraft, but uh, we've got flat spring steel landing gear, and when it's in the down position, it's certainly streamlined with the airflow, and in the retracted position, we've got the whole frontal surface facing the wind, so there may be some other aerodynamic features there that are causing that, but uh, that's certainly, as far as I can see, uh, part of the reason that uh, it's uh, lower in the air. As I mentioned, the FAA didn't give this uh, full uh, mass production type certificate. They were uh, individually certified aircraft. Uh, they didn't build many of them. This is 37 or 38 of this variant. They experimented with lots of different versions, tricycle gear, four seats, bigger engines, that kind of stuff. So it, it kind of really does have that whole experimental sort of vibe to it, but this one is still certified airplane. So that can make things a little challenging as there's not a huge support for the aircraft with so few of them being built. A couple have been put into the experimental category uh, in various ways, and that gives them some uh, flexibility with modifications and changes. Uh, there's a very nice looking one in Sweden. I've had the pleasure of talking with uh, the owner of that, uh, Martin. Uh, hello, Martin, if you're watching. And uh, his is experimental. They've gone to a 200 horse with a fixed pitch, so that would be really interesting to see how that works. Uh, and that aircraft's been experimental for a very long period of time. Uh, there's a really neat website, actually, uh, listing lots of information on the different ones and what's happened to them. I'll post that in the uh, link below, and uh, you'll be able to go and have a look at that, and if you're interested, have a read about this kind of neat airplane. Now, because it's so unique uh, and different, that also does produce a little bit of a problem in terms of insurance. So, we have liability-only insurance for the aircraft because nobody will give you hull insurance for it. Uh, it is not an experience thing or anything like that. It's just actually a type written on the policy as, uh, for the insurance companies as excluded. It's r right up there when you when you see it. It's, there's, there's nothing you can do about that. So you've got to be comfortable that you're going to fly this liability only. You can't protect the hull. Now, I, I should clarify. You can protect the hull on the ground. So, you know, if the hangar burns down or if it blows away in a windstorm when it's tied down at another airport, you can be covered. But there's no hull coverage for flying it. Uh, maintenance is, uh, you know, it's it's a standard O320 Lycoming, it's a constant speed propeller, so, you know, in Canada, 10-year overhauls on that. It's a bit of a rare propeller that's on this one, uh, so that can add a little bit of, uh, again, expense and difficulty in finding parts. Um, you've got retractable gear, but it is all manual. The big expense you're going to get with any sort of amphib float, or in this case, a flying boat where your hull is the... Uh, or your fuselage is the hull, is what I was trying to say, is that, you know, da damage there or corrosion or leaks can be very difficult to fix. So we had a couple of jobs that needed to be done on this, and uh, it's very constricted workspace in here. Uh, we had to tear the floor up, tear all the rudder pedals out, like just completely dismantle the airplane to get to it. So that can add a lot of expense um, to your maintenance side of things. You definitely need some additional skill. It's not uh, a friendly airplane on runways. Uh, it really demands a lot of 
skill set. Uh, it's not happy in lots of crosswind on the runway. In fact, it's rated for more crosswind on the water than it is on land. It really wants to go backwards on you. There's so much weight back there. So you've got to be very diligent and uh, and you've got to really, you, you do have to limit yourself. You can't fly this uh, in as winds as, as bad as other models of airplane. Obviously, being a flying boat, docking is going to be more of an issue on the water compared to a conventional uh, float plane. But with the ability to drop the wheels down, beaching is a much better option in this than uh, than a float plane. So, kind of depends what you're doing, what mission you're you're trying to fly. I just got us in a bit of a descent here, going to have a bit of an inspection here on Buckhorn Lake and get us set up for a, a water landing, and uh, that'll be kind of fun. So definitely a big adventure win, this airplane. Um, it's only a two-seater, but uh, it can take two people and full fuel and a fair bit of baggage. It's got a very useful, a very good useful load. And uh, the ability to fly off of land and land on water, albeit you've got to be a bit more careful with your winds, obviously gives you great freedom. For my part of the world, it's also really nice. Uh, certainly I like the twin engine flying for the more remote areas. Uh, but uh, you go, um, you know, much further than we are right now. Uh, you can even maybe see the fields are starting to get pretty small here. And uh, if I bring us around to the uh, to the north again here, the fields disappear. We get into bush and rock and lakes, and that's all there is. So there's not really any good landing sites for uh, on wheels. It's going to be really exciting. But there's a lot more options for water landings. Really interesting airplane. You're certainly going to stand out and get yourself some VIP parking. Uh, you're going to get lots of people coming and talking to you about it. There's generally about two reactions to this thing. They either think it's super pretty and one of the nicest things they've seen, or they think it's, uh, well, what did one person say? It's got a face that only a mother could love. So uh, definitely two ends of the, of the spectrum. I've not really had anything in between. Everybody reacts, wow, that's amazing, or that's so cool, or oh my gosh, that's a really ugly airplane. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's kind of fun. The next big challenge with uh, any Amphib at all is always remembering what you're landing on and where the gear is positioned for that landing. Not as simple as just flying a retract where you pull the wheels up to fly and you put them down to land. We've got to have the right undercarriage down for the type of landing we're doing. Okay, so I'm in my downwind here, so we are landing on water. The gear is up for a water landing, and I have one light for water landing. I can see the, and I can see it there as well. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and bring my mixture rich. Use 15 flaps for the water landing. 70 miles an hour on the approach. Myself nicely trimmed out. Okay, final landing checks. Mixture rich. Prop high RPM for the go around. Gears up and latched. One light for the water landing, and the wheels are up. We are landing on water. Just keep flying. Slowly letting you down. There we go. That's what we're talking about. That is a water landing in glass water. Sure use up a pile more lake doing it. flap set. Put the bottom rudder down right now. Head calm. Bottom rudder is up. Easy on the power. So we don't get too much water over the nose.
great versatility. I mean, it's an amphib, water, land. Really fun airplane to fly, but very challenging to learn how to fly. Very stressful on that side of things. So you're going to need a really competent tail wheel pilot. You're going to have to take lots of time to learn it. You're going to need to be able to master wheel landings and three-point landings. The wheel landing, very... Uh, advantageous in this for crosswinds. The crosswind limitation on land, not good. So that's a big downside. Uh, it's a rare airplane, so that's not great. The fuselage is also a boat, so that's not great in terms of uh, maintenance and cost and doing work on the aircraft can get very challenging in a hurry. The lack of being able to get that hull insurance, that's a challenge as well uh, and something worth considering, although I mean, nobody wants to crash, but uh, you really, really don't want to crash on the water. So, you've got to take the time, you've got to not paint yourself into a corner. Be well trained, well rested, fit to fly. Take your water flying really seriously, because it can go wrong in a real hurry. And when it does, it could be really, really bad news. So, have the proper safety equipment, you know, we've got special life jackets for the airplane. I think next year we're going to be doing a lot more flying with this, so I'm looking at getting a, a, a spare air as well, so that you can actually get a couple breaths uh, if you have to do a exit from the aircraft while it's uh, immersed in water. Maintenance, a little challenging uh, in, in terms of the parts as well. The view, though, is really phenomenal. I mean, it's... There's no engine in front of you, right? So nothing in the way up there, and uh, it's a mid-wing, high-wing. I'd call it a mid-wing, but maybe that's just because the engine's on the roof. So you can look behind the wing, above the wing, out front. You can look up behind. The, the view's phenomenal. So, I mean, it, it really is a joy to fly. I'm, I'm still in boat mode as it were, so uh, we got 23 squared here right now, we're doing about 85 miles an hour, so it's about 10 miles an hour you lose with the wheels up, as opposed to the wheels down, but we're going to run out of lake here in a bit, we're going to go land and get some fuel, so we'll be going back to airplane mode, but it is a truly, truly wonderful plane to fly, it's just rare, and it's a real bear in the crosswind, so hope you found the video fun, please subscribe, and like if you enjoyed the video, we'd love to hear your comments, Everybody stay safe, get lots of flying done. We'll talk to you all soon. Happy tailwinds.